right. Well, what a wonderful day it is to be here and to be in the Lord's house. Amen? Amen. It is a good day to be here and grateful that you chose to be here and uh, grateful that we can come and we can worship together if you're visiting with us. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to be here at Forest Home. And uh, in the back is, uh, of your pew is a card, if you'll fill that out, and take it to the Welcome Center, which is through those double doors over there to my right, to your left. Uh, we would love to give you a gift uh, if you'll fill that out. Uh, we won't harass you or anything. We just want a record that you are here, and uh, that way we can make you aware of all the things that are happening at Forest Home. So uh, thank you for uh, coming, and uh, as we worship today, I pray that you join in as we sing and as we worship through our voices and through uh, the teaching of God's Word. Let's pray together as we begin. Let's stand together. Y'all need to stretch out. Y'all look like y'all half asleep today. Let's pray together. God, as we come today and we come to, uh, to worship, God, what a beautiful day that you've created for all of us. And uh, Lord, it is a day that you tell us to rejoice and to be glad in it. And Lord, and Lord today we come rejoicing, uh, knowing, Lord, that you are in control. Knowing, Lord, that you have the power over everything in our life. And, uh, Lord, that uh, we would come uh, humbly before you. God, that we would recognize who you are in our life, uh, in this world. And, God, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth today. God, be with us, Lord, as we uh, sing songs, Lord, that would uh, uplift the name of Jesus. And, God, as we hear your word today as it is preached, God, my prayer is that uh, through that, Lord, that you would draw people to yourself. Lord, that you would be honored and that you'll be glorified today. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. It is good to see you. We're glad you're here. I want to take the opportunity to thank Brother Scott for taking care of things for us last week while we were, while we were out of town. Uh, it was a wonderful service. We did watch you. We did stream the service. For those of you that are watching streaming, welcome. We're glad that you've been with us today. You're going to get the opportunity to do something that we don't get to do in Baptist churches very often. We're going to start a service with hymn 339. It says, Standing on the Promises. Just remain seated. You don't have to stand up for that. <laughs> Let's sing together. Y'all are all standing up. Standing on the Promises.
come to take up and to receive God's tithes and offerings. And my prayers is every Sunday that you give according to as God has, has blessed you and uh, that, you're, uh, that we are faithful uh, to give to Him. Brother Ronnie, uh, come and pray for us as we take up our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We're so grateful that we get to come into your house and hear your word. We ask that you bless everyone here, and if you have illnesses, just reach out to the good Lord, and he will protect you and save you. Watch over each and every family represented here. Keep them in your loving arms. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
Thank you, Brother Mark. Thank you, choir. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23. Look at verse 23, and then we're going to skip 
and look at verses 27 through 28. We will pick up 24, 25, 26 next week. Okay? Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 23, and then we skip to verse 27 through verse 28. Y'all remember the TV show Fear Factor? Joe, anybody watch Fear Factor? You can admit it. It's okay. You can admit you watched it. Y'all, they used to do some crazy stuff on there. I mean, I started to show a video, but I know it's close to lunch, and I didn't want to make any of y'all a little queasy. But they used to do crazy stunts where they would jump off buildings. Of course, they had, you know, harnesses on and stuff for safety. But, man, they used to do some crazy stuff. The craziest thing that I ever saw them do is when they ate, uh, I think it was pig intestines raw. They laid it out like they didn't clean out the intestines. You, you get the picture? And uh, they had to eat them. Y'all remember, y'all remember seeing that? I started to show that, but I didn't want to make you sick. And at the end of the show, or when someone would get eliminated, y'all, y'all remember, I think it was uh, Rogan. What's his first name? Uh, Joe Rogan, right. He was the host, the original host. You know what he used to say? When somebody would lose, fear is definitely a factor for you. Or when somebody would win, he would say, fear is not a factor for you. So this morning we come to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23 when we are looking at our faith and what our faith is and what our faith should look like. Faith should faith can be measured. We've looked at that. Faith can be measured. You should be able to see somebody's faith. You should be able to look at somebody and say if they have faith or not. And we come to this point where we see that our faith really is, can be also evident in our life when we have this fear of God. Now, we're going to look at what fear is, and really just some examples to the life of of Moses and Moses' parents, uh, and how we can demonstrate our faith through the fear or the reverence of who God is in our life. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23. It might help if I get there too. Verse 23. And then we'll skip to verse 27 and 28. Hebrews 11, 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he persevered, as though seeing him who is unseen. Verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch them. Let's pray as we begin and continue. Father, speak to us this morning through the power of your word. And God, I pray that all of us would really understand and really provide examples of faith in our own life. And one way we do that this morning, as we will learn, is through our fear of a holy God. And so God, thank you. Thank you for our time together. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you agree that fear is a powerful motivator? Fear is a powerful motivator. One thing that I'm scared to death, if you want to see me scream like a little girl, get me on top of something tall. Y'all ever been to Gatlinburg? Y'all ever been to Gatlinburg? Anybody ever been to Gatlinburg? A few of you. Have y'all ever been to the top of Ober Gatlinburg? Have you ever taken that big tram that takes you from Gatlinburg to Ober Gatlinburg and that thing is suspended by a toothpick over the, the canyon? Y'all ever been up there? If you don't like heights, don't do it. Stephanie, we had just got married, been married two or three months. My best friend, my roommate in college, best friend since we were in kindergarten, was getting married 
and he was getting married in Gatlinburg. They all wanted to go to Ober Gatlinburg. They all wanted to go on the tram to Ober Gatlinburg. I thought it was a terrible idea at the time, but me, 22 years old, didn't want to be like a little, a little sissy in front of all my buddies, and especially my new wife wanted to be tough. We get in this tram and ride to the top of it. Well, we get part of the way, and it's a drop. And I look, and I'm like, uh... I literally, there is a pole in the middle of that tram. I literally sat down in the floor, straddled the pole, and held on. <laughs> I did. Fear is a powerful motivator in our life. We all experience fear to one degree or another. Whether we fear things, objects, or phobias, whatever it may be in our life, or rather, or rather we fear people. And most of the time, our fear of people is the fear because of what other people can do to us. We fear how people might react. We don't confront things because we are afraid how other people may react. And God, this morning, God does not want, to, want us or desire us to be bound by the fear of man, but to be bound by the fear of God. To fear God first and of most importance. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 1-7, you've heard this verse before, the fear of God is what? The beginning of wisdom. When the Bible talks about fearing God, it's not saying that we should be afraid are scared of God. It wants us to treat God with the utmost reverence and respect. And when we fear God this way, we will understand that man truly is not the issue. I don't have to fear other people. So this morning as we look at and we understand what it means to have this fear, this reverence, this respect, this authority, not a, oh, I'm afraid of you, like you're going to jump around the corner and boo, okay? But that you have this reverence. And it's the lesson we learn from the life of Moses. And Moses, in his faith, it simply means this, that faith means fearing God rather than fearing man. In verse 23, the first thing we learned this morning is we should not obey the commands of man that go against the commands of God. We should rather obey God rather than man. Look at the life of Moses' parents. The Bible identifies Moses' parents as Amram and Jochebed. Jochebed, it kind of sounds like it should be reversed. Jochebed is the mother. Okay, it sounds like it should be the father. It sounds like a dude's name. Amram sounds like a girl's name to me. I, I get it confused all the time. We learn from these two, we learn that fearing God is more important than fearing man. We should obey the commands of God rather than obey the commands of other people. In verse 23 it says, By faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict or the king's commands. We should understand that God should be and is the ultimate authority in our life. So when someone commands us to do something that goes against God, we should certainly do what? Say, no thank you. No thank you. We should clearly put God first. 
So why, do, why is that hard? Because we all have done it. Why is that so hard? Because we fear the reactions of fellow man. When I say man, I mean man or woman. We fear people. We fear the power of authority or influence. And that influence and power is strong. And you should respect power and authority and influence. Some of you have power, authority, and influence. You have that. But when that person of power and authority and influence, they should not supersede what God has told you and commanded you to do. Now, the Bible tells us in a number of places what we should do with people in authority in our life. God is the one who has established authority in our life when it comes to government. We should obey government in our life. We should obey our bosses at work. We should obey our authority in church and at home. And God requires you Okay, this may be the first time some of you may have heard this. God requires you to submit to the authority that God has placed over you in your life. It's not up for debate. It's not up for a a table discussion. It is up to you and your responsibility to submit to the authority that God has placed over you in your life. It is God's commands. So when you don't do that, you lack fear of God. You say, well, what God says really doesn't matter in my life. I don't fear that God has the ultimate authority in my life. I just choose to do whatever I want to do. Wives should submit to their husbands. That doesn't mean that you say, yes, yes, master. Okay, yes, king. That's not what it means. It means you understand your God-given biblical role as a wife. Same thing for husbands. Children should honor their parents. When mom and dad tell you to do something, guess what? You shouldn't question. You should do it. If there is a question, I usually give mine a good answer with a belt. They understand the answer pretty quick. Those that have bosses, you should respect the authority in your life. Church members should obey the authority that God has put over you in your life. You as a citizen, I guarantee, if you get out this morning and you drive down 259 and the Kilgore Police Department is sitting right down here and you're going 95, if he don't pull you over, he's not doing his job. And you should get a ticket. Right? Can you get out of that ticket? Maybe. Maybe not. Don't call Todd. He ain't going to help you. (laughs) Right, Todd? (laughs) But he can show you grace. He can show you grace and say, I'll let you out, but slow down. Okay? You're not going anywhere. Slow down. But if he gives you a ticket, guess what? You deserve the ticket. You you will obey that authority because he has it. And we should. That govern our society, that govern our government, we should respect them. But there is one exception. There's one exception. When their rules or laws go against the authority of God in His Word. And we find a number of examples in the Bible. For example, when King Darius of the Persians commanded that no one should pray to any god or man except himself. We read this in Daniel 6, verse 10. It says that Daniel went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. 
And three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. In the book of Acts, when the Jewish court commanded the disciples to stop teaching in the name of Jesus, the story is found in Acts chapter 5. How did they respond? We must obey God rather than who? Men. When Pharaoh in Egypt commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill all of the Hebrew boys at the time of delivery, we find in Exodus chapter 1, we find that the midwives feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do, and they let the boys live. We should obey the authority that God has placed in our life, except, except when it supersedes God's authority. And we should obey God. When you have faith in your life, when you are living out your faith in your life, parents, children, those that have jobs, church members, you respect and obey the authority that God has placed in your life. Kids, if you claim that you are a believer and you do not obey your parents, you're showing that you do not have faith. Parents, when you don't make your kids behave, when you do not discipline your kids, whatever discipline looks like in your home, when you do not discipline your kids, you are showing that you do not have faith in your life because there is no fear of God. When you go against what your boss says and he tells you to do something and you do whatever you want to do, you're showing a lack of faith, a lack of fear of God. As a church member, when you do not respect and submit to the authority that God has placed in your life, you show lack of faith. You show that you do not have fear of God. We find that Moses' parents hid Moses because they saw that Moses was no ordinary child. He was different. At the time that Moses was born, Pharaoh had a standing order. You remember? He had a standing order that every male child born to Hebrew parents, was to be thrown into the Nile River, and how was what was supposed to happen? Kids were going to drown. Can you imagine? I mean, how brutal. How brutal. Every child that was born, every male child that was born, to be thrown into the Nile River so the child could die by drowning. But Moses' parents chose not to obey Pharaoh but rather chose to obey God. Instead, they hid Moses for three months after he was born. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. In Hebrews eleven twenty three, 23, gives us two reasons why his parents did this. The first one, they saw that Moses was not an ordinary child. Now, different Bible versions or translations translate this verse differently. Some say they saw that Moses was a beautiful child or a fine child or a proper child or an unusual child. That's what people said about me when I was born. Very unusual. They still do, by the way. He's very unusual. The Greek word actually means elegant, proper, or well-pleasing. If you go back to the book of Exodus, it says that his mother saw that he was a fine child. The Hebrew word simply means a good or excellent child. Now, I never was called an excellent but unusual child, but something was different about Moses. Something was different about him and his life. I think what a great... What a great example and a great just testament for us that we should be unusual. 
that we should be different. We should be different than everybody else. So, what, what caused Moses' parents to hide him for three months? Was it because he was just beautiful or unusual or different? Or, or was there something a little more? Now, after all, all of you think your kids are the most beautiful kids in the world, right? Hopefully you do. Hopefully you think your kid or your baby was the most beautiful baby. I always think babies, all babies look the same to me. When they're born, they all look the same. I don't know if they're pretty. Sometimes I've looked at babies and be like, ooh. <laughs> bless, bless him. <laughs> or bless her. Oh, man. My, sorry, my ADHD went, went going on. But... But they realized something was different, and they thought, hey, there's something extraordinary about my son. There was something special. They discerned. The Bible, uh, the idea is that they discerned that there was something special. And because of that, they said, hey, look, we're, we're not going to obey Pharaoh's commands. We're going to obey God's commands. Verse 23 goes on to say that Moses' parents also was not afraid of the king's decree or the king's edict or the king's commands. Josephus was, is a uh, historian or a church father. And through the life of Josephus, we find some um, details. The king's edict was more than just, we find from Josephus, that the king's edict was more than just the death of the Hebrew boy, all the Hebrew boys. The full edict of Pharaoh's command simply was this, that if the parents should disobey him and do the opposite of what the king wanted. Not only did the boy die, but the parents died also. The whole family would be killed. So doesn't that kind of raise the bar a little bit? I mean, nobody would want to see their son uh, killed as a baby. I mean, you just who would, who would want to see their son thrown into the Nile River to be drowned, right? But not only that, they would be killed also. They used to do some cruel stuff. And they would lock you in a box. They would chain it or lock it. I, I'd say chain it, but they probably didn't chain it. They'd lock it and throw you in the ocean. Leave you to drown. Can you imagine? <laughs> they sit you on a stake and put you on fire. That's, that's not a way I want to go. They would do some crazy things. They'd pull you apart. They'd pull your legs off and pull your arms off. They would do some crazy things. So what about Moses that caused him or caused his parents to hide him for three months? He was different. And Moses said, his parents said, we're not going to obey. We're going to obey God rather than the king. Verse 27 also tells us, Hey, don't be afraid of other people. Don't be afraid of other people. Fearing God rather than man is something that we should naturally do in our obedient Christian lives. It says in verse 20, 27, By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Moses, Moses persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Now, the word persevere naturally means to keep going or having the strength to keep going, to endure. So what gave Moses this strength to persevere, to endure 
despite Pharaoh's anger and wrath. It tells us in verse 27 why. Because he saw him who is invisible. Now, that's kind of a strange sentence. You read that and you're like, I don't get that. That's a weird sentence. How do you see someone who is invisible? Right? How do you see something that is invisible, that you can't see? Some people think that this refers to Moses seeing God at the burning bush. And that could be a part of what verse 27 is getting at. I'm not 100% sure. But I naturally think, because of the flow of the text, that it naturally speaks more of the faith of Moses. Remember what faith is, right? Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what? What you do not see. Moses persevered because he saw the invisible God through the eyes of his faith. He trusted God. By faith, he focused on God who was invisible. God is spirit. God is not a human being. Okay, God is spirit. He's, not, he's described in human characteristics, but he is spirit. And Moses persevered because he saw God through his faith. People all the time, we've got in this new experiencing God kick. Like we all want this experience when we come to church. We all want this experience with different things because we're so entertained friendly. We want to be entertained. Which is fine. You can like to be, I love to be entertained, and I know you do too. You love good stories, you love good movies, you love good music. You love all those things. But we've gotten to this point that we love all of these things. But what Moses, what Moses had was right in front of his eyes. He had faith. Moses was seeking God by his faith. And there he, he didn't fear. He didn't fear the reaction of Pharaoh because nothing else mattered. Now, do you fear the reaction of people? When someone asks you this weekend, tomorrow, someone, you go to work tomorrow, or if you go to the grocery store, whatever you do, if you're retired, whatever, you still work, you go to work tomorrow. But you go to work, and someone says, hey, what did you do this weekend? What do you say? What do you say? Hey, we went and watched the new movie. Hey, man, that was a pretty good movie. You need to go watch that movie. Oh, my son, he had a game, or my grandkids had a game. We went and watched them. Oh, we were going out of town visiting some family. What, what, do, you, what do you say? What do you say when someone comments on the news? We've had a lot happening in the news lately. There's been a lot of things to talk about in the news with president and the Olympics and everything else that's going on. Let me tell you what is the greatest thing Monday, tomorrow, when they ask you what you did this weekend. If you want to open up an avenue to share your faith, say, hey, I went and worshipped yesterday with my family. We went and worshipped at church. Hey, by the way, did you happen to go worship anywhere yesterday? Say, so, yeah, hey, where did you go? Sometimes we are so afraid to share anything that might be controversial in our life because we fear what other people are going to say. Verse 28 tells us this, that we... And you and I and everyone, you will suffer the same consequences of those who fear God. You will not suffer the same consequences as those 
who reject a holy God. We find here in verse 28 that Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood. Now, this has to do more with God's response to our fear. It is a more of a motivation or a reason why we should fear. Now, do, you, do y'all, if you've, if you've ever been a boss in a company or anywhere in your life, if you've ever been a boss, sometimes you have to give proper motivation. Right? Sometimes the proper motivation is, if you don't do your job, you will be fired. Right? Y'all ever had to give proper motivation as a boss? If you don't do your job, you will not have a job anymore. As a parent, sometimes you have to give proper motivation. Sometimes my proper motivation was a switch or a big mining belt. I don't know if y'all ever been whooped by a big mining belt. If you've ever been whooped by one of those, you wouldn't want to be whooped again. Or I had to go cut my own switch or whatever was handy for my mom to grab a hold of and whoop me with. Proper motivation. Sometimes in our our life, we need proper motivation. That's why the Bible tells us that God disciplines those who belong to Him to give us the proper motivation. Sometimes you need a little tap on the rear end to get going, don't you? Because sometimes we wouldn't do nothing if we didn't get a tap on the rear end. God has to provide the proper motivation in our life. The Bible tells us in verse 28 that Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. The sprinkling of blood, if you remember, it refers back to the tenth and the final plague on Egypt, which took place, if you remember, on the night of the first Passover when God did what? He told Moses that he would send the death angel to take the lives of every firstborn son in Egypt, right? And God gave Moses very specific instructions. And he told them that he should do it, and the rest of the Israelites should do it in order to preserve their lives and the lives of their own firstborn. Each household was to do what? To kill a Passover lamb... To take that lamb, they were to take some hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top of both sides of the door frame. No one was to go outside that door until the next morning. And when the Lord went through, he was going to strike down the Egyptians. He would see the blood on top of both sides of the door frame, and he would do what? He would pass over. And he would not permit the death angel to strike down the firstborn of that house. Stories found in Exodus chapter 12. Hebrews 11, 28 tells us that Moses kept the Passover. Doesn't mean he kept it for himself, okay? But it means that Moses instituted the Passover for all of Israel. And Moses instructed all of Israel to do and to follow the instructions of the Lord. What was Moses doing? He was fearing God, wasn't he? I mean, proper motivation was the fear of God. I guarantee you this this morning. If you hear nothing else that I say, if you've been half asleep or just dozing off, hear this. Hear this. God desires in order for you to fear God. God, if you are His kid, He will give you the proper motivation. If you do not fear God, you do not have faith. It's impossible. I fear. I fear the consequences 
of me not being obedient to God Himself. That means I do what God tells me to do, regardless of what anybody else thinks, anybody else says, how crazy, how stupid, how strange that it may be. I come to God's house, I worship Him, I'm faithful to Him, I give to Him, because I fear God. I fear the consequences of a holy God upon my life. It provides proper motivation for me to live a godly life. Do I stink at it most of the time? You betcha. I do. And you do too. It's because we should have faith. And Moses says, I'm going to do what God says because I fear Him, because I have the utmost reverence and respect for God Himself. This morning, one of the main ways we demonstrate our faith, one of the main ways you can demonstrate your faith is by fearing God rather than fearing man. Fear God. Fear what He can do. One day God will rain down His wrath upon this world. It's going to happen at some point in time. We are facing and seeing the judgments of our own wickedness and our own sin in our life. If you look at the things that are going on... um, God brings judgment and has brought judgment upon the world for years, for decades, for centuries. goes back to the Old Testament, to God's people, the Israelites. God brought judgment upon them. God brings judgment upon our nation and has and will continue until He comes. One of the things I think about a lot in my life and demonstrating my faith is I don't want to stand. I don't want to stand before God. And he says, Hey, Neil, you, you did all these things in my name. You did all these things, but I never knew you. I didn't know you. We can do all the things in the name of the church and the Bible. And we can say we have faith and we can talk about faith. But in order to have faith, you people's got to see it. People's got to know that you have faith. People's got to see that you're willing to obey God than rather obey the things of the world and get sucked in to the traps of what the world desires for you to do. This morning, do you have faith? Same question I've asked you every Sunday. Do you have faith? Can people see your faith? One way they see your faith is because you fear God rather than fearing man. This morning, if you have faith and you say, you know, Neil, man, I, I, I lack, I, I lack this, pray. Ask God to direct you, to give you this fear, this reverence, this respect. I I think it should come naturally. This morning, if you have no faith, maybe you've never trusted in Christ. Maybe you've never given your heart and your life to Him. It's pretty simple. God says to confess your sins, not to me and not to anybody else. You confess your sins to Him. You tell him what you've done. You've got to tell him all that you've done. He already knows all that you've done. You can't remember all that you've done. Confess your sins to him, and God is faithful to forgive you of your sins. You admit that he is the one, that he is the Savior of the world, that he came and he died. You can be saved this morning. If you confess to him, knowledge who he is, trust in him, he can save you, and he will save you. He can change you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you.
Thank you for your word today, and God, thank you, Lord, that no matter what happens in the midst of our world and our country, God, that you are still in control. God, that you're still here. You're still moving in the midst of your people. And God, I pray this morning, God, that we would all have this reverence, this respect for who you are. God, that we would have this fear of a holy God. God, it gives us proper motivation to live a holy and godly life. God, thank you for our time, and I pray if there's someone here that's never truly trusted in you, Lord, that today they would trust in you for salvation. For those of us who struggle, we know Christ, but God, we struggle. God, I pray that we would give it all to you today, God, that we would trust you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Stand with me.